Hello? All right. Thanks, everybody, for bearing with us while we set that up. Um, my name is Jarrell Cook, and this is Josh Sunderland, and we're from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, as you can see from the title of our presentation, we made it sufficiently, uh, 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 sufficiently vague so that we could decide what we were presenting uh, within a few days of actually presenting here. Um, so what we're going to present today actually is Josh is going to present some work that he's done on measuring latency through RF knock. Um, and I'm going to present some uh, work that I've done on um, using an op open source tool to model and uh, generate applications for Mac layer and higher um, uh, implementations uh, for building wireless protocols. And then also the, uh, a toolkit that we built to make, that, make it easy to marry those applications with GNU Radio. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over. Actually, one slide of further ado. Um, uh, who we are, APL, we're a university-affiliated resource corporation. Um, we have researchers that do everything from marrying prosthetics um, uh, with uh, brain implants for mind control to, uh, um, to building spacecraft that, uh, like the New Horizons probe that, that uh, um, explored the solar system. Uh, we do have a booth um, in the expo, so please stop by and see us. So now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Josh. I'll get him going. And there should be all the stuff. Uh, check. Uh, uh, so, good morning. Uh, my name is Josh Sunderland. Uh, I am an embedded systems engineer at APL. Um, uh, this, this work uh, accompanies a paper that's in the technical proceedings um, entitled Measured Latency introduced by um, uh, RF knock architecture. Um, so this was uh, funded by DARPA. Um, it's not uh, um, US government views per se, but or official views. But uh, this was under um, a program with uh, Tom Rondo as the uh, program manager. Um, so a little bit about uh, my background. I uh, worked in audio, went to um, where it was working in SDR. Um, uh, doing SIGINT and commercial applications uh, and had kind of heard uh, about GNU Radio but hadn't worked in it. Um, then I ended up at, at APL and this is kind of my first foray into RF knock and GNU Radio so this was kind of like a, a um, drink from a hose type of situation for me. Um, so I learned a lot. Uh, the community is amazing uh, with all the information out there help, to help people troubleshoot things. So. Um, Specifically at APL, I work in the uh, air and missile defense sector um, in a group called A2E. So what we focus on is uh, predominantly radar and electronic warfare systems development. So we do some comms work um, and some SDR work, but we're a little outside um, in terms of what we deal with, um, aerial threats, uh, mostly for um, surface-to-air warfare. Um, so. For most of you, this is probably a preaching to the choir, but um, for those of you who aren't aware, um, RF knock is an uh, open source framework to um, basically move, uh, you, or you can move blocks that you would have in your GRC flow graph and target them to the FPGA that was on the USERP. So um, it's, a, it's a really great tool. And uh, the other thing that we, we kind of found was, you know, it helps streamline all that background processing um, uh, tasks, tasks that you don't necessarily want to get into if you're just trying to put algorithms and signal processing um, chains onto your, uh, onto your radio. So um, again, this was our first foray into it. Um, so big learning curve, and, uh, uh, but, but very fruitful. Um, so for, for uh, my group um, and for this program, you know, the question is why do we care about latency? Well. Um, we're working in, you know, um, the defense sector, so uh, we have real-time requirements for everything I've worked on since I've been at APL. Um, you know, when we're dealing with a cruise missile or an aerial threat um, coming, coming at us, uh, you know, there's not a lot of time to, um, to process the information that we're getting in, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, seeker radar waveform, um, jamming waveforms, whatever it is. So um, 
our goal with this was to, we were new to RF knock, didn't know anything about it, um, had been tasked with trying to characterize it. So our, our first thought was, let's get a latency measurement. Um, and uh, so, oh, um, so uh, my concept to, to do that was kind of uh, simplistic in terms of just look at the AXI stream, try to access the uh, T-valid signal, um, and follow it, uh, pipe that out to the USERP's front panel GPIO, and then just trace it uh, step by step. And what we started with was, you know, have two blocks talking to one another, see how long it takes to propagate from block to block. And then from doing that and gaining more familiarity with the architecture, that kind of blossomed into, let's follow T-Valid at every little step we can. Um, so the scope changed a little bit. So you can see here, it's a, again, a very simplistic um, idea. You know, you have the crossbar where data packets are being routed um, from knock block to knock block. We created two simple um, uh, CE um, knock blocks, a sender and receiver, or in the accompanying paper, it would be uh, block one or block two. Um, but again, they're sequen sequentially addressed off the crossbar, which is important. Um, and this was all running in uh, AXI simple mode, so um, this was a 32-bit data payload. So let's get that. Um, compared to the other flow graphs I've seen in the last day or so, uh, ours is uh, a little pathetic, but we just have, <laughs> uh, just have a signal source to get the AXI stream um, moving data. Um, and you can see the three middle blocks have RF knock um, colon, which means they are targeted to the FPGA. Um, the DMA FIFO was included with RF knock. Uh, we made sender and receiver. Um, and the DMA FIFO is just allowing us to prevent underruns, um, basically let the FPGA ingest enough data to keep it happy. Um, this was all over one giggy uh, Ethernet. Uh, it was a Ubuntu um, uh, laptop computer. It was a Edis X310 uh, um, usurp, but it's skinned as a NI uh, 2953R. Um, and then we were using a, a digital oscilloscope. And again, those specs are more further detailed, uh, including the software environment and versions in the paper. Um, and then the null sync just ends the uh, flow graph. Um, so the question is, why do, why do we follow T-Valid? Well, uh, from the top graphic, you can see if you look at T-Valid, which is circled in red, um, and then two below that T-data, uh, T-valid uh, will go high when T-data gets its uh, relevant header, um, and then it sub subsequently goes low again once um, the data of that, of that packet is uh, um, uh, closed. So uh, we figured, you know, use T-valid to signify to ourselves that um, we do indeed have a valid data packet. Um, and the, the other benefit of T-valid is that it is tagged at each part of the, uh, each sublayer of the uh, knock block. So that was our kind of our access portal into it. Um, so here, uh, as again, I'm sure most of you who have worked with RF knock in any um, capacity are well aware of, but um, you off, this is basically inside that, that earlier view of the crossbar with two uh, knock blocks, sender and receiver. If you were to burrow into one of those blocks, um, this is the framework that RF knock provides you um, when you RF knock mod tool add whatever your block is. Excuse me. You're going to get a knock shell, an axi wrapper, a user IP um, submodules, and then you have uh, you have um, user registers. So ours was our user IP was uh, exceedingly simple. It's just tying um, m axi data to s axi data. Um, not registering it, nothing fancy, just push that data through. Uh, what's the most bare bones uh, latency measurement? Um, uh, so uh, we'll go into a little more detail uh, of each of those layers. Um, so here uh, at the knock shell, um, you know, there's, there's people here who can describe what this is doing a lot better than I can. Um, but this is all, again, open source, so you can go in and look at uh, the Verilog file for the knock shell for the Axi wrapper and get a better idea of what's happening. Um, in red, you see the, uh, 
the variables that we're following. So we are looking at I underscore T valid to um, STR sync T valid uh, as it comes from the crossbar down into the user IP um, or towards the user IP. And then on the way back out, the outgoing path, you have uh, STR source T valid to um, OT valid. Um, so again, this step is, uh, oops, that's actually wrapper. I'm sorry. Um, so this is uh, the clock crossing FIFO as it, as it shifts into, uh, into that um, sublayer, and then you have a MUX and DMUX. Um, the AXI wrapper is that further step down towards the user IP, so it's going to deframe the, uh, the uh, packet header. Um, in our case, again, we're using simple mode, so you can see under header FIFO, we're going to just take that header uh, off the incoming data packet and then reappend it on the way back out. And you see on the right side, MAXI data and S axi data are just set to equal, so very simple. That's in the user IP section. So again, this is the upper level view of the two blocks that we really care about. Obviously, off this crossbar before would be the DMA FIFO, but um, we weren't concerning ourselves with that. So we'll dive back in, and you can see how these um, variables lay out over each sub part of this uh, knock block. And again, if you look in the top left, you have uh, knock underscore block uh, underscore star. That just signifies that, you know, knock block sender, knock block receiver, whatever your knock block is named, has this uh, underlying structure. And these variables will be available to you um, if you choose to use them or look at them like we did. So here we have uh, the timing of a signal coming in off the crossbar to the user IP. So uh, we incurred 93 nanoseconds um, at the knock shell, 13 nanoseconds at the axi wrapper, and 1.9 nanoseconds at the user IP. So the, um, the radio cores, the DAC, the ADC uh, is running at 200 mega samples per second. Um, so nominally, uh, even though some of these layers are, have different clock rates, um, but nominally, you know, you have a five nanosecond clock cycle, so that's just as some perspective. Um, but we're, in this case, we're all in the nanoseconds, so things are looking good. Um, and again, that 1.9 um, should really kind of be in the middle of that user IP. That's um, the time it takes m axi data to oops, become s axi data. Um, so back on the way out, um, we have, this is where we really incurred the majority of our latency. Um, on the outgoing path at the axi wrapper, you can see it's 1.71 microseconds, so orders of magnitude higher. Um, and again, I, I can't necessarily speak to why that's happening. I have some uh, opinions, perhaps, but um, you know, you can look in the code. And and uh, um, and part of why we wanted to release this was to um, allow these results to help other people deciding is RF knock a good solution for my some of my blocks or some of what I'm trying to do in my chain, um, as well as you know, point, pinpoint where problems might be happening so improvements could be made. Um, each of these measurements was taken 100 times, so this is a mean amount. Um, all of these values have very low variance, so um, if you add them up, and we also measured this, which is the difference between IT valid in that block and OT valid, so the time it takes to propagate through all these layers, um, you see at the bottom right it's 1.88 microseconds. Um, so out of that, you can see the axi wrapper being 1.71 microseconds really dominates that figure. Um, so back to the outward view, you can see with these red arrows, that's basically the, the signals where we tapped into them. Um, moving forward, uh, if we want to get the next part, we, we want to look at the crossbar, so the time it takes to go out of the sender and into receiver. So at the top right, you can see we measured that to be 65.4 nanoseconds. Um, this step has the most variance somewhere, or I guess standard deviation on the order. I think it's like 20 nanoseconds or so, which makes sense given the burstiness of uh, axi stream. Um, so that will change the the uh, you know the variance as we get add this. So if we add this to the first result of the sender being 1.8 eight, eight uh, microseconds, then add this 65 nanoseconds, we get this total block latency of 1.95 microseconds shown at the top. Um, again, that shows some variance because of the crossbar variance. Um, but that number really is pretty close to your uh, 
single block latency, and then which is again dominated by the Axie wrapper. Um, so this is really the crux of our findings. Um, this was pretty consistent and measured many times on both blocks, so we feel confident in those results. Um, sorry for the switching back and forth. <laughs> um, so as a conclusion, um, for our work in, in AMDS at, at the Applied Physics Lab, this architecture overhead, um, as well as the reliance on a host computer, would probably preclude it from some of our applications um, at its current state. Um, and that's because we're working in different theaters and, and uh, demoing, you know, it, it, it's hard to sell sometimes uh, having a host computer tethered to it. Um, the, uh, the block capacity of 10 for the X310 also uh, could be seen as a, a mitigating factor in terms of scalability um, or integration of complex designs. Because again, what we're finding here is that you're gonna add two microseconds of latency bare minimum with each block that's thrown in. So uh, if you have start stringing a few blocks together, you're going to start summing that latency as well as um, incurring more as you incorporate more clock cycles at the user IP level. Um, two things we wanted to hopefully try to do in the future as this program kind of evolves from DARPA is um, evaluate a longer or extended Axie stream packet size. So not just 32-bit um, data, but 64 or 128 hoping that by packing more data into each header, maybe that process starts to look a little less um, uh, time consuming. And then also, you know, this is pretty easy to implement. Um, I don't have code on GitHub yet, but um, if, if you contact me, I can kind of walk you through it or show you, only because it's very hacked together code, but um, how to pull these signals out. You could, you could pretty easily add most of these, um, this type of uh, analysis into your blocks if, if you look at, you know, what's my timing here and here at different levels? Um, so, or uh, think of improvements to some of those different sub-modules in the knock block. Uh, that's another option. Um, so, and I just want to take a second to thank, uh, you know, uh, everyone who worked on these different references. Um, they were massively helpful, especially getting started with RF knock uh, development. I think that was my homepage for like three months. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, um, just wanted to thank everyone for uh, the community and uh, DARPA, um, APL, uh, my colleagues, uh, for their support and help with all of this. So hopefully it's helpful to some of you as well. And that's, that's all for me. No, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so um, what I'm going to present to you all is uh, um, it's kind of a combination of two things. So one of the things is, is this toolkit I developed called Cheesy Mac, um, which is really just a toolkit to marry another um, GPL v3 open source project with GNU Radio for developing Mac layer implementations. Um, so first of all, what's, what's the motivation here? Right, anybody who's done... Um, uh, even a moderately complex transceiver in here for communicating on a network, for joining a network, um, and so on, has probably done this paradigm I've seen in a lot of implementations, which is the custom block, right? You go, you go into mod tool, you create a custom block, and then you put in the guts of, of what you want your, your Mac layer or above to do. Um, you know, the, the issue with that is quite easily, you know, it could become very um, unmaintainable. It could really quickly get into a spaghetti code situation. So, um, and it makes it difficult for the rest of the community to kind of leverage the work you've done and potentially make use of some of those components. So, um, the way we're attempting to solve the problem is by leveraging this open source tool or framework really called um, uh, QP. Um, and QP really consists of, um, uh, a mo graphical modeling tool, um, which you don't have to use. Um, you could actually just write the code by hand if you want to. Um, I kind of equate it to like using GRC or writing the Python or C++ for a graph by hand, right? Um, it also consists of um, the actual framework itself, 
um, the, the code framework, which is either based on C or C++. Um, and that provides you the um, ability to, um, to model your system as an event-driven system. Uh, and the QP framework was originally developed uh, to support embedded system development. Right, so if you think about embedded systems, one way to model those is as um, event-driven systems. So they need to respond to user input potentially, they need to respond to other systems, input from other systems, and they may need to respond to timer interrupts. Right, so hopefully this is kind of um, you know, ringing some bells. These are the same types of things we need to be able to do in communication systems. So, um, so just a little more information on um, QP. Um, there's a company that supports it. It's called Quantum Leaps. And it was started by a person named Mero Samick. And just to show you how small the world is, um, I emailed Mero before I came here and said, hey, you know, I'm using this, your tool. And, and uh, um, you, may, you may not have ever thought about it being used for communication systems, but we're getting a lot of use out of it. And he said, yeah, you know, actually, I've often thought about that. And actually, um, uh, before Matt Edis started Edis Research, we worked together. So small world. Um, uh, but the QP frameworks, um, like I said, C, C++, they have a number of ports to different embedded system targets. Um, um, tens of thousands of downloads per year actively supported, right? Dual licensing model. So GPL v3 is what we've been making use of, but they also have a commercial license if you need it. Um, the modeling tool, graphical model-based design tool, like I mentioned, um, this is a really powerful tool. And um, another little component they provide is QTools. Of main interest here is um, a component they call QSPY, which allows you to capture runtime tracing information from your application. So. Um, Again, just to summarize, it provides a framework per, for um, thread per state machine execution, manages your event queues for you, um, allows runtime tracing, and that model-based design. All right, also, um, you know, big plus documentation. Um, they've developed a lot of documentation. This 700-page book, which kind of walks you through um, how to develop hierarchical state, state models. Um, and actually how to apply it and the tools they provide. Um, they have a number of application notes um, available on their website. All of this stuff is available by PDF also. Um, and, uh, you know, like I mentioned, it's, it's open source. You can go out and download it today and start using it and building applications off of it. All right, so, um, so now where does, uh, where does Cheesy Mac come in? So this is, kind of the architecture of the framework, right? So if you look at this model, um, everything in pink and orange is kind of provided by a QP. Everything in gray needs to be provided by the user or the developer, right? So you gotta provide the hardware, this little component they call the BSP, and then your active objects are really your application code. Um, so what we've done is we've, we're trying to, to make it easy for developers to jump in and use this and integrate it with GNU Radio. So we provide some that BSP code for POSIX targets, um, and we provide some quote unquote extension objects, right? So some objects that you could potentially reuse in your applications. Um, this is um, just kind of some, uh, um, information on what our goals were here, right? And that was really to, to provide a, a toolkit that allows um, us to kind of share information at the Mac layer and above, the same way we do it at physical layer um, in GNU Radio. Okay. All right, so going backwards here. Um, so this um, model might look kind of complicated, but um, I'm, going to spend a little bit of time on it so I can give you an idea of, of what we did versus what's provided. So um, this is really kind of a blown up version of what you saw before, but um, the gray parts are kind of the, the user application code. Um, the brown parts are other open source projects we've leveraged, Protobuf, Libcrafter, ZMQ. 
Um, the orange parts, like in the other one, are provided by QP, and the yellow parts are what we created in Cheesy Mac. Right? So um, the, the flow of actually creating an application is similar to in GNU Radio. I created this tool called QM Mod Tool. It creates your project, very similar to what GR Mod Tool does. Um, and then you also use it to add additional state machines to your project, just like you would add another block to your project in GNU Radio. Um, then you can use a quantum modeler to actually generate your source code. Um, the source code that's generated by the framework is, is MISRA compliant, so Motor Industry um, uh, Standards Reliability Association. I think that's what it is. Um, uh, so really all that is is a, is a huge collection of best practices um, for code development. Um, so it's actually really high quality code. Um, so um, in looking at this model, really what we've done here is um, we've loosely coupled GNU Radio with these applications so that um, you can develop an application um, and talk to it via GNU Radio over ZMQ for control or passing um, frame data back and forth. Um, and we tried to make it really easy to, to stand up an application and really get it up and running and, and focus on, your, on what you really want to do and not focus on the, the low-level issues of actually just getting it working. Um, so, so I'm going to um, skip over none of these things because it will be made available. But uh, um, the important thing here is that... Um, uh, public, we have public release review underway, and um, it, we're going to post it to GitHub at Cheesy Mac Toolkit. It'll be licensed under GPL v3, um, and we're going to try to post a, a good bit of information there on how to kind of get up and running and um, make most efficient use of that. Um, and that's really what I have. So, let's see if any questions. so you guys can probably take one question while Maitland gets set up. Thank you very much.